Hello and welcome everyone to today's NEASC forum presentation, AI and the Imperative of Agency. We're so pleased to have a panel of students and teachers with us to engage in a dialogue uh, about AI. Uh, they're here to walk us through some of their key practices and effective approaches, uh, as well as discuss concerns and challenges. Uh, I'm now pleased to turn it over to my colleague, Kelly Christian, who will share some more about today's webinar. Kelly? Thank you, George. Hi, everyone. It's so great to have you all with us today. My name is Kelly Christian. I'm our Director of Strategy and Membership here at NEASC. Um, we held a forum a few weeks back on AI and education, unleashing the power of AI and education with nearly 2,000 people registered and joining us from all over the world. Uh, this forum is a follow-up to that forum. One of the topics that really came out of that initial discussion was we take a lot of time to listen to webinars, to read articles, to look at the research, but how much are we really interacting with the AI itself? And so I'm just curious as we get started, I'm going to ask if you can put in the chat if you're open to it. Uh, have you yourself experimented with AI? Have you used a chatbot? Have you used uh, any sort of other um, AI technology? And if so, could you put that in the chat and tell us a little bit about it? So just to get to know you a little bit as we uh, start interacting here with the panel. So as I mentioned, uh, we had a forum a few weeks back, uh, digging into all the levels from policy to curriculum around AI and education. One of our panelists, Nate Green from Sidwell Friends, uh, was with us on that panel and was the co-creator of today's panel. A lot of the questions we received were around practical application in the classroom. And so this forum has been put together as a conversation between teachers and students about what students are looking for, what they're seeing, what their questions are, how they're using AI, and with teachers for how they're applying this in the classroom. So we hope that this will be a learning experience for all of us. This is a, this is a dialogue today. We want you to participate in the dialogue in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, we're really grateful, especially to our students for joining us today and sharing their perspectives and the openness that everyone's bringing as we're all learners in this space. And so we come uh, together today in that context. The title of today's presentation focuses on agency. One of the things that we've realized through our conversations at NEASC is that we've all been looking at student agency for a number of years now, interacting with it at different levels, but AI really forces agency as an imperative for both teachers and students. Uh, this technology allow, uh, insists that we place even stronger emphasis on critical thinking and core skills, as we call them. Uh, so that is today's focus, and that's why we're going right to the source uh, for our teachers that are using their own agency in the classroom and our students that are working hard to do so as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Nate to give a little bit of uh, his introduction to why we put this session together, and then we'll get started with introductions. Nate? Thank you, Kelly. I'm thrilled to be back with the NEASC audience on this webinar panel and so excited for the group that we have here of teachers and students because um, as we sort of talked about the last time is there's a bit of a bit of a missing Venn diagram where like how our students are using it is very different than how our teachers think our students are using it. Um, and so this is the perfect day to, to start bridging that gap, which we very much need to do. Uh, and uh, the reason you're all here, you already know this, but we're trying to update our frameworks for what is you know, acceptable use, what is responsible use, how can we get help from these things? Um, and that's gonna take some time and some effort on our parts. And of course, uh, we are all aware on this call uh, that you know, an AI output is not the same thing as learning. Um, so what do we do as teachers and students to uh, take advantage of this tool, but also continue to uh, you know, do great teaching and learning the way that we always do in our schools? Um, and I like, I'm particularly excited to have, you know, teachers as a, as a focus here, teaching, teaching in the classroom and teachers and students using this, um, because I think uh, we are on the front lines to figure this out and make it work. Uh, and I think just one last point on this to sort of set the stage for what we're going to discuss today. I think the big challenge for us is 
you know, how do we continue to develop student skills in an age where an AI can write essays and solve quadratics and conjugate verbs? Uh, and I think for us as teachers, um, it's our job to, to make it very clear uh, what students can do, when, how, and why, in addition to teaching them some AI literacy skills. Um, and I think at least in my short experience playing with these AIs last couple of years, um, it's you know, on us to sort of identify what skills we're working on and how we want our students to use this AI because what I have found is that it actually can help our students do incredible work uh, and pick up skills much more quickly, uh, but only if we design it correctly. Uh, and so that's that's what we're going to talk about today, how to do that, how to isolate those skills and how to have AI be an assistant and helpful to our students to, to develop the skills that we have been teaching so well for so many years. So again, excited about this. This is the right audience for this. And I hope that that helps set the stage for some of the things we're going to talk about. And the panelists will provide great anecdotes and insights um, to help us leave this panel with uh, the, the ideas, the tips, the tricks, uh, the, the AI literacy lessons we need um, to start working with this uh, right now. So that's my hope. And uh, you know, excited to be here. Thank you all for joining. Great. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, again, greatly appreciate the co-creation of this, this webinar today, Getting the continuing the conversation, getting even deeper into the classroom. It's great to see in the chat, it looks like many of you are experimenting with AI, see a lot of chat GBT use, uh, a lot of um, checking in on writing as well uh, as kind of the main two uses and, and some others with a little bit um, uh, additional applications. So I'm looking forward to hearing from all of our panelists about how they're using it. And again, encourage you to keep the conversation going in the chat as we go. So I think we'll get started with introductions from our panel now. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. And we're also going to ask them for a starting question as a part of introductions. In this school year, what has been your biggest aha moment with using AI? So I think we'll start with Rachel and then Emma from Avenues Online. Hi, my name is Rachel Ostring. I teach Upper Division Great Works at Avenues Online. Um, we have a relationship with the other schools in the Avenues Network, but our campus is fully online. Our students are global all over the world. I'm uh, currently based out of Guatemala. Um, we do do synchronous sessions with our students. Um, however, so much of our learning takes uh, place and is also incorporated with our learning management system on our platform. And uh, this year, starting in January, our school integrated its own AI chatbot. Uh, it's named Savvy into our learning platform. And so I think the biggest aha moment for me this year has been um, because we've been very open with our students and tried to integrate using Savvy, our chatbot, AI chatbot in uh, our lessons, is watching students evaluate the difference between a good answer over a correct answer. And uh, really picking apart the difference of those things and, and what makes an answer good versus just correct. My name is Emma and I'm calling from New York and um, I'm also I'm a junior at Avenues Online and I'd say my biggest aha moment um, with like AI is seeing how like different AI chatbots like give different but similar answers. Thank you, Emma. Great. We'll go to Christina and then Morgan and Sebastian. Hi, my name is Christina DiMasselli. I am the director of EdTech Learning and Growth at Pinkerton Academy. We are in southeastern New Hampshire, about an hour north of Boston, and we are the largest independent high school in the United States. And uh, having to choose just one aha moment is tough because the last year has been a little bit chaotic with all of the developments in AI. But um, I'll look to just last week, I was in a health sciences class where students were giving a presentation and two of the students talked about radiology and becoming radiologists and all of the information that they had uh, put together on how to uh, get into that field. And as they were talking, I realized I had just read an article within the past month or so about AI and radiology and the changes that that makes. So... <clears throat> that was interesting because I realized the that the students didn't know anything about that. And I looked over at the teacher and realized the teacher didn't know anything about that. So now then I'm going to our um, admin and saying we need to have a talk as our kids are doing their career explorations and finding what they're passionate about and doing research. 
we need to add this component of how AI is going to be affecting each and every thing that they're going into. Uh, hello, I'm Morgan Harris, a director of academic technology uh, and also a philosophy and religion teacher at Choate Rosemary Hall uh, boarding school in Wallingford, Connecticut for about 850 students, uh, about 75% of whom are boarders and about 150 faculty. Um, I echo Christina's sentiments, it is, it is tough to pick one, but uh, so I'll go with the most recent uh, when I was visiting Sebastian's class just yesterday and talking with him about what they, what they, and his teacher, what they've been doing, um, utilizing both, you know, standalone chat GPT and also GitHub Copilot. Uh, I, I said to Sebastian in class yesterday, I was like, coding as it is taught today is going to radically shift and you're not going to need to know a lot of the things that you're that you're currently learning uh and that will be in the service of making you know way more awesome things and then watching the uh, the opening keynote from the open ai dev day yesterday there was an hour-long presentation diving deep on and really affirming that intuition where th this guy was was uh spelling out exactly um how that sh shift is probably going to take place um so yeah it's exciting to, to open up um possibilities for people to code using natural language. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm a senior uh, at Choate. Uh, that is my teacher. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd say one of my aha moments in um, AI especially is when it came to solving a practical solution uh, early in this year. Um, so. Uh, I'm on the robotics team uh, at this school and I was tasked with picking up an object um, using a robotic arm. And one of the ways that I devised going about it was by using a camera system. So I took like a webcam and I used uh, a TensorFlow um, unit from Google. It's, it's, a, it's a specific AI that lets you program uh, and incorporates programming and um, artificial picturing and uh, programming. Uh, and I was able to uh, use that to pick up the object in any orientation, any direction, whatever the, situ the situation. And it was a really big moment for me to like, hey, this can really be used, you know, not only just in education where I found it really helpful with, you know, um, programming tools and stuff like that, but also in, you know, like for future applications. Um, so yeah, that's just one of the really big aha moments for me. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, and let's go to Nate and then Daniel. Hi, all. You already met me. I'm Nate Green from Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. I actually had the privilege of teaching Daniel this summer in an AI class on the ethics and bias um, behind these new AI language models, uh, which was very exciting. I'm happy to be working with him uh, again on this panel. And real quick, an aha moment for me was I was designing an AI activity for my science and math departments, and I was having I was going back and forth with ChatGPT to have it develop a simulation or a game to make lessons much more interactive and exciting for students, while also differentiating, differentiating the caliber uh, of the questions that it was asking and, and making the students do in the course of this game slash simulation. It was really cool, really fun, and I wanted to teach it the next day. Awesome. Thank you, Nate. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Mahari, and I'm a freshman at Duke University looking to study economics with a concentration in finance. Uh, and uh, after taking Nate's class, I found myself uh, with a new sparked interest in, in learning about AI. So I, I wanted to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us and have these important discussions as the presence of AI grows. Um, but my biggest aha moment when using AI this year would definitely be realizing the educating potential that it has due to the in-depth responses that it can give on a wide variety of topics while being very accessible. So I think AI has a very high ceiling if you used properly in academia. Great, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Really excited for the conversation. We're gonna cover a number of topics today. We got hundreds of questions submitted. Uh, we also discussed as a group uh, what topics we wanted to share with you today. We're gonna cover things from assessment to assignments, uh, to the ethics and curriculum around AI, AI literacy, 
Um, where we'd like to get started is to ask our group, starting with the students and moving to the teachers, what new skills do we need in this age of AI? What new skills are we looking at? Do we need to be looking for? Do we need to be teaching and preparing our students to have in this age of AI? I'm going to ask uh, to start with Daniel and then Emma and Sebastian, feel free to jump in. Cool. Um, thank you, Kelly. So I think that's a great question. Um, you know, in the age of AI, I think that educators have to understand how AI operates. And I think school districts, along with tech companies, should collaborate to train AI bots with the proper data sets that will allow students to learn with accuracy and efficiency if it is to supplement their education. I will admit, though, the type of assignments assigned will probably look very different uh, once we begin to accept uh, the presence of AI in academia. And I have, and honestly, I have no idea what that will look like. But I believe that currently, as its presence grows, our biggest concern will definitely be finding a way to train AI chatbots with the right data set and then teaching educators how to implement that uh, within their um well, within their curriculums. Yeah, I can jump in from here. Um, I really like um, one word or one sentence of this phrase about like, um, you know, uh, I think teachers and students finding, you know, a correct answer versus a good answer. I think that really sticks within um, a lot of what we're dealing with in education today. Um, and I think, I think it's, I think uh, AI is super beneficial for me, especially um, in terms of um, like even just asking problems to be solved, especially for like physics class, when I have to deal with a whole bunch of, you know, well, well let's say I have, a, I have a test. I actually have a test today and I was able to use ChatGPT to ask questions about um, like, hey, uh, give me some questions I can study for for, you know, my test uh, just to because I want to come up with this. But I think it's very important that we are we're able to communicate with uh, sort of this framework in a correct way. Um, I mean, uh, with I mean, if, if I was if I was to take that uh, question in mind, um, I'd, I'd want to make sure that the you know ChatGPT knows that I'm a high school student. I don't know I don't know too much about you know physics just yet. So being able to correctly um, form good prompts with it and being sure that you're able to communicate in an effective way, I think, is probably one of the very beneficial ways um, in creating a great environment for students and teachers. Yeah, adding on to that, I'd say critical thinking, although like it's a very important skill. And I think in this age of AI, it's like even more important because what the, the answers that the chatbots will give you are not always going to be like accurate. So always having in the back of your mind, like, oh, you got to fact check this, like, oh, like go on the internet, find a reputable source, fact check it is going to be such an important skill for students to have to have like a healthy relationship between um, with AI. Thank you all. I love um, I love those answers. I think critical thinking is is huge. And Daniel, I appreciate that you brought up, and I'm sure uh, the teachers here in the forum appreciate that you brought up the need for educators uh, to have those skills as well. So we're not just talking about the skills that students need to have, but the training uh, and skills that we need to bring to our educators as well. Um, would any of our teachers like to take on this question? Sure, yeah, I can hop in here. Um, so I just came back from a conference called the Wisdom and AI Summit, and I think that word wisdom is incredibly important now. Um, this is, of course, an ancient word, but it is also new to us in um, an education system that has um, taken any <laughs> aspirations toward wisdom kind of out of what we do to this point. We're, we're very good at specializing in our certain subjects. And now we're being faced with this reality that these LLMs, uh, in many cases, can can do the specialist stuff better than many humans can, and so that puts us in the position of absolutely needing to cultivate wisdom and a holistic orientation toward the world, so that when we interact with these things, we are doing so from a place that is grounded in. Um, you know, is coming from our highest self and um, can kind of see the interconnections between everything uh, and can can work with these these agents um, 
with a certain sense of discernment, as was just alluded to by, by the student. Um, yeah, so wisdom. Go ahead, Rachel. I can jump in on this. I think one thing that I've really noticed this year um, is looking and teaching students what questions to ask. Uh, so we have as part of our assignment, one of our book club assignments, we have students actually ask one of their questions to our chatbot Savvy, copy paste Savvy's response into their book club document, and then analyze what made the response good, what is the response missing, things like that. And one thing that we've noticed as teachers in reviewing these submissions is that students will get slightly different responses based on the way they ask the question. And so teaching students um, what are the key points to ask the question, uh, what keywords need to be in a question, how do you structure a question to get a specific type of answer, uh, sometimes that can be just as an important uh, a skill as being able to, you know, just receive the answer, um, is knowing the questions to ask, um, as well as how to evaluate the answers. Christina? And, and I'll add... Um... So when, when looking at the, the question is what new skills do we need in the in, in age of AI, excuse me. Um, anytime I bring up AI with people, especially when it's new, is it's a very overwhelming topic and it brings up a lot of big emotions. And a lot of educators think I need to change everything that I'm doing in order to be ready for this. And I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think that we are better prepared than we believe. And so it's not always new skills but it may be just a, a little bit of a tweaking or transition from the skills that we're already using. So things like the critical thinking and how are we gonna talk back and forth with these uh, chat bots? And Emma, when you said healthy relationship with AI, that phrase right there needs to go in a t-shirt, right there. Um, other things like um, we already teach students about primary sources. So now we just have to bring that into the next phase of that and, and think about primary sources because the LLMs, these large language models, um, hallucinate and can give you incorrect answers. So um, I think some of it is just bringing the skill sets we already have and just kind of massaging them a little bit so that they um, are in our sphere where we're now educators that are AI aware, that we know that AI is present in our classrooms, doesn't mean that you block it and it's not there, it's it's there no matter what, and you have to be aware of that and how to work within it. So not the big scary change everything, but how do we shift and change what we're already doing to be AI aware? And that's a great uh, point for me to pick up and, and steer us towards our, our, our second question. Um, but just a summary that a lot, a lot already covered. We we talked about asking good prompts and good questions. Sebastian and Rachel were talking about that. Emma was talking about exercising our critical thinking skills and our fact checking skills, uh, which which Rachel echoed. Uh, and then you know we we were Morgan was talking about how we take an AI output and turn that into wisdom and what that looks like. And my goodness, what a great challenge for teachers! And so excited to to be living through this. And I I think Christina a great point to to say that. You know we are poised to do this. Uh, no one, no one better than us. And uh, on that note, um, you know, I think you know, positive note that that we have these, we have the ability to to make an impact here and do the right thing here. And it's just going to take a little massaging, a small, a small change. And so along those lines, um, our second question for the panelists, and I, I'll start with the students. Um, uh, I'll just direct it at you, Emma, uh, because I know what Daniel's going to say because I taught him this, but. Uh, where do you learn about AI, including its its benefits and its shortcomings? Like, how do you learn new things about it? Um, and you know, you know, how can we as as educators and teachers in schools um, help augment that and make sure that it's coming from good sources? To your point on, on fact checking and getting quality information. To Rachel's point about correct answers, uh, you know, how do we help you learn about what these things are, what they can do, and what we should be worried about? Yeah, so I'd say like um, where like we're like in my network specifically in um, Avenues Online, um, we really learned, like, I think our career, like our teachers were constantly talking about it and we we're kind of more like kind of experimenting with AI, like trying all these weird props, like what's the time in New York or like these like random silly questions um, just to like experiment with AI, see where it may have like false information or like in all of that. So it was like, I think a lot of it was just learning through trial and error and really just like, like, hands-on 
constantly talking to the chatbots was how we got like a lot of our information and then having a conversation in classes like how to appropriately cite AI what we think and just like what we think about AI I think that's where we like personally I got a lot of information about like how to use AI yeah I I really like uh what Emma just said uh I, I agree a whole lot about just like really just jumping in and getting your just hands in it. Um, really just like sort of not worrying about like the whole over encompassing, like, what is this? Just, just, just asking simple questions. I remember uh, yesterday, I even asked um, uh, ChatGPT to make a new language with me. So we spent 20 minutes like, all right, how do you want the language to sound? And you can just go step by step and just like, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to go straight to the deep end. Um, you can always just like, say, how was your day? And just keep asking it simple, simple questions. Um, and I think that's probably the best way, uh, at least uh, in, in, in the terms of education to learn it as well. Um, and I think, yeah, just really just getting your hands and your hands dirty is a really great way to just get used to it, get, get in that mindset of, uh, you know, figuring out ways of uh, applying this thing to education um, or it's like your well-being. Um, and yeah. Um, great question, Nate. Um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that, like, I think, you know, Emma and Sebastian can agree with me, but I think it's fair to say that social media is pretty much involved in every facet of our lives, um, especially for Gen Z. And, and I say this because I vividly remember watching a TikTok about ChatGPT when it was first released and how it was this groundbreaking technology, you know, that could answer um, any question. Uh, and of course, I ran to try it out and and ask it these silly questions, you know, not knowing a single thing about how AI works. And my point being, a lot of the news people receive, especially in my age, and and mostly in general too, um, is off of TikTok and maybe Instagram. And, um, you know, specifically those videos cover either the academic advantages that AI chat can provide, uh, and sometimes other services, or, you know, it's it's sort of the type of video you might see where you're, you know, a content creator is warning you about the dystopian, you know, horrible future that may result as of AI taking over, you know, and that further exasperates, you know, the distrust that people have uh, towards AI. And, and so I believe that there's more of, I feel like there's more inter entertainment going on than information when it comes to AI on internet uh, and social media. Um, and but in person though, people my age just mostly discuss AI in regards to the academic advantages that we can get from it. But I believe that it's it's sort of the responsibility of educational systems and institutions, as well as maybe educators, to intervene and change this current approach and view that students hold on AI and how they go about discovering it. Cool. Um... There, so we, it uh, sounds like uh, Emma and Sebastian agreed to the importance of experimenting and getting, getting your hands dirty. Uh, and Daniel talked about the, uh, about tapping in to social media to get a variety of perspectives and also the, yeah, the responsibility of, of educators to help um, students see how these tools can be incorporated into their lives beyond simply getting quick help on an, on an assignment. Uh, and that, that speaks to the, to the, you know, wisdom piece that I mentioned earlier. And I'll, I'll um, add on from the teacher perspective with this question before transitioning to um, the next one uh, for teachers at show, we set up two, two kind of main tracks. I mean, we had one, all faculty professional development thing earlier early in the term and then that has been followed up by monthly ai playgrounds where that's all about the experimenting getting your hands dirty once a month during thankfully we have a collaboration block built into the schedule this year so people can bring their lunch into the faculty lounge on wednesdays and um so tomorrow you know we're going to be diving into the amazing set of new features that have popped into chat gpt plus in just the past few weeks yeah, people are going to have their minds blown tomorrow. <laughs> um, and and then additionally, we have a reading group that, act, that only meets asynchronously. So we actually use the same kind of tools that Sebastian, some of his classmates use in classes I teach and some other uh, teachers use. Uh, hypothesis for social annotation of articles. So we'll post one article a week and people will comment on them. Um, 
and sometimes they'll actually drop their chat links on if there's for example an ethan mollick you know one useful thing blog post that has uh, a, a prompt example in it and we encourage people to copy the chat links from when they've actually used that prompt in the wild to show people examples of of what it what it looks like in their particular context um and then there's just all these um then, then you just run into people in the dining hall and on the path and stuff and spark up little conversations uh that are that build upon those things that we're interacting with in the playgrounds and, and in the uh, reading group so i recommend a similar kind of multifaceted approach to any anyone else out there on this call who who may have some influence to um chart the direction of faculty professional development out there um so for back to the to the students here very curious for you all to reflect on when should we intentionally not be using ai i can i guess i can answer that yeah sure um <clears throat> I guess one of the first big things is, um, is uh, I, I think I, this is kind of encompassing a lot of things, but I think the phrase um, thing that doesn't really, I mean, it's, if we're talking specifically in school, then really something that sort of bypasses your way of education. Because I mean, if we're talking about uh, like AI or um, uh, LLM, LMs, sorry, for um, education specifically, the, the main goal is to educate. Um, so, I mean, sort of by taking the example I had with like, you know, finding problems or reviewing essays, um, is a great tool, I think, for, um, for you to have in order to, you know, become a better student, become educated, ask those questions. Um, but when it comes down to like, you know, straight up copying and pasting answers, that's not really, I think is the greatest solution for AI. And I think it's not necessarily something that has to be that way. And it's, I don't think, I don't think it's something that schools need to be, I, I think, I think it's something that should be, you know, talked about, but I don't think it's something that schools should absolutely entirely, um, you know, not use uh, AI for. I think there's a lot of benefits to, um, you know, having that um, just mindset of becoming, you know, more educated and, and learning from, you know, mistakes and learning from um, this new tool that we've all been given. Um, so I just want to say that, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's definitely a lot of different, uh, different ways you can be using AI. Um, like, I mean, like for tests or for homework or whatever have you. Um, but I think, I think it's great to have that open conversation with students and faculty about, you know, what the expectation is within the school environment. Uh, we sort of had that conversation, uh, with an all school meeting last week where we sort of talked about what we were going to be talking about going forward. Um, and the status quo right now is basically a class by class basis. Um, and it's really a ask before anything else, just to be sure. Um, so we, I think, I think that's really just the biggest thing is just um, figuring out the best way to, in order to, you know, progress your education, you know, cause that's really just cheating yourself out of school, uh, which I don't really think is the best time. So, yeah. Yeah, echoing um, what Sebastian said, um, I agree. And it's like that AI should help us like learn, but not do the learning for us. And it's like, for example, shouldn't you should not be using it to like how you said, like copy and paste, like in this, like copy and then like a and paste an assignment or all of that. And like using it, perhaps like engaging with it in a way, like asking it questions like, oh, how did you get that answer? Why did you multiply by 10 or something like that? And constantly engaging with the AI in their answers. I think that's really important. Christina? Yeah, Christina, go ahead and then I'll jump on. Okay, so we have a couple of tools um, or a couple of things that we think about when it's the when not to use AI. Um, one was um, a statement that was adapted from Sentient Syllabus, which is online, which is a good resource that says assistance from an AI system is too much when it interferes with the educational objectives or the assessment of a submitted work. So that's one of the guidelines that we work with. We also provide our faculty with um, this kind of continuum of AI use. 
that's all all the way from one end of the spectrum that is completely student cr uh, created, no interference from a bot, to the other side, which would be totally bot created, and a lot of different um, ones in between. And you can find these online. So for example, like Matt Miller from um, Ditch This Textbook has one of them. So this is not an original idea of ours. But you can talk to the students and then land on where, um, sorry, let me see if uh, I, I'll share that in a second. Um, you can see where you're going to land. Are you going to land where AI created a response? I read, edited, adjusted, and submitted, and, and decide where. Also really nice for group work. If you have a group working together, some want to use AI and some don't. If you have this continuum and say, if, you know, we're not going to go any higher than this on it, then that kind of gives them um, a space that they're comfortable working in. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think, again, like this is what me, I, I feel like I'm saying the same point every time, but I'm glad to be saying it, which is like, this is what we're good at as teachers is to try to figure out what things that our student might need help with that they should use an AI on, and then what skills that we're evaluating and developing as a teacher that we don't want them to use an AI on. And I think in my experience talking with students about this, especially the students on this call, I mean, they want to learn, like they, they certainly want to play around with AI, they want to see what this is, but they want to exercise their critical thinking skills, their fact checking skills, their analysis skills, they want to turn information into wisdom. And let's just meet them there, right? And so I think for us if, as teachers, like finding the right thing that we're really working on, um, and saying, hey, this is the thing that, that we're working on in this unit, do not be using AI for this thing, or, you know, and, and but outside of that, you can. And I think, one opportunity that this opens up that's really important is for students that are weaker in one area, um, AI can just be a huge help that just can quickly get them up to speed in whatever it is, you know, writing or math or, you know, however they learn differently. Um, this can, you know, really help uh, and be, be an assist that will then get them up to a better level in the skill that you're assessing and working on. So I think we can get more out of our students and help them develop skills quicker um, if we're using it, but we just need to be smart about what we're using it for and what we're not using it for. Um, and, you know, level with our students, because as I said at the outset, you know, they're, <laughs> the way they're using it, we're using it right now, we're, we're talking past each other. Um, and so that's going to take conversations like this one uh, to bring us together. Thank you, Nate. And I just wanted to name, we're getting a lot of questions in the Q&A and in the chat uh, around kind of administration level topics, privacy, parental permission. Appreciate Christina putting some questions in the chat, um, but we are going to try to stay focused. We only have 20 more minutes together today in teaching and learning in the classroom. So we promise to continue to provide resources on these more uh, administration focused topics, uh, but we're gonna keep the conversation going and now move into a discussion about assessment. So uh, I'd love to talk to the teachers now about uh, what does assessment look like in an age of AI? Would one of our teachers like to start off on this top, this large topic? <laughs> And I know Nate just set us, teed us up for this quite well. Christina? I'll start. Um, so when I'm talking to teachers about this, and I, the first question I have is, um, what, what do you value? Is it going to be the product or is it going to be the process? And there's no wrong answer there. It could be either or or both, depending on your goal at that time. But I think that looking at the process can be really important. And this goes back to that overwhelming feeling, I've got to change everything, and you really don't, you have a lot of the tools that you already need. So if I've got a paper that I've assigned to the kids and it's due in three weeks, um, I have to be AI aware, I have to know where AI can interfere in that process and think about that. So I'm not just going to assign it and wait for it to come back. Now I'm going to focus attention on that process. And maybe I'm going to build in things like uh, student teacher conferencing, really good feedback loops, maybe some good Harkness discussion, um, pull out any of the things that John Hattie talks about, Jigsaw, QFT, uh, reciprocal teaching, all of those things and start building those in. Um, these are, you know, scientifically studied things that we probably know how to do, but maybe we're not using them as much um, as we should. So that's that little bit of that shift. Remember that massaging things just a little bit. So we're doing it on the student side and what we're uh, teaching them, but we're also doing it on our side instructionally. You have a toolbox full of things. You don't have to change your entire curriculum. You just have to look at how do I just make sure that I'm doing those touch points along the way. Thank you. 
Rachel? If I can jump in there, I, I really like what you said, uh, Christina, about not having to completely change, but maybe use different tools in our toolbox. And that's something that we've noticed this year. Um, our curriculum department did change many of our book club documents, but they changed it to include questions that beyond moved beyond some reading comprehension and some you know basic analysis and moved to more personal connections. So we're asking students, you know, what are some personal connections you're making with the text? What um, areas of the text are you interested in learning more about? Or what topics are you interested in learning more about? What this has actually done is blown up our in-class discussions. Students are coming with all of these personal connections now that they've made. And then in class and in our in-class discussion, we're going back to some of those other literary analysis um, opportunities where we're saying, okay, you all really emotionally connected with this point and you had you felt you know you had some personal connection to it. Let's look at why. How did the writer construct this? And so it's again using those same tool tools that we've had in our toolbox, but kind of maybe inverting how we've been doing that. We've you know moved some of some of it, uh, changed the uh, individual part, the the worksheet part, um, uh, tweaked those questions a little bit, and then moved the in class discussion to some of the things that we've been doing before. And so I think it's the same tools; it's just using them in slightly different ways. Um, and I this year I've noticed huge engagement from the students with the text that we're reading and their ability to speak about them. They're coming so confident because they feel so personally connected to what they're saying. Morgan? Thanks yeah, so time. building off of that, just dropped a link in the chat. Uh, there, There's uh, an app that we've been experimenting with called Sherpa. Uh, I actually met with the developers uh, this summer. Love the hustle. There's these two Stanford kids who straight up went in the directories of all these schools and cold emailed key people, including myself. And I actually... It, it stood out to me among all the spam solicitations I get every day. It was like, huh, what is this? And they, they, they um, are very earnest kids who are building something that already works quite well. Uh, it basically, we, you can feed it either, uh, students can feed it their own papers or you as the teacher can feed it um, your reading assignments. Or in, in our case, like we, we watch a lot of video lectures and I, I get the transcripts for those and feed it the transcripts. And then it will ask questions. It, it will have the students speak about the reading and it will ask, uh, I don't know, five or six questions total. And each successive question is tailored based on the prior response that the student gave. Um, and it, uh, or it's asking real in-depth questions about the material to see if they grok it. Um, that's that are just customized to exactly where they are. Uh, quite powerful, highly recommend people Check that out. Their whole impetus for developing this was we don't want to, um, we don't think that the solution is more surveillance and monitoring for the assessment issue. It's like, how do we create new avenues for additional engagement? And of course, the teacher gets, the teacher then gets a dashboard where they can see all the videos and interactions and certain parts of it are flagged where it thinks like, oh, this may be a stumbling block or the student crocks this very well. Um, yeah, check it out. It's called, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, it's called Sherpa. I dropped the link. Uh, I guess it, yeah, at 9.44, the sherpalabs.co is in there if you post up. The chat moves quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. And Rachel, I loved what you said that uh, that it just blew up how things are happening in class. And, and that's where I'd, I'd like to take us next in the discussion. So um, how, how has AI changed how students show up for class? You know, AI, uh, Rachel has said quite, uh, quite significantly in her case, and I'd love to start with the students on this topic. So how has AI changed how you and your fellow students show up for class? If you can learn the material later with AI, why focus and participate in class? What does it look like? How is it different than it was before? Emma, Sebastian, or Daniel, would you like to start off with this? Emma? Oh, actually, Daniel, go ahead. Um, so no, yeah. Kelly, that's definitely an issue where, you know, when when answers or like, you know, the correct answers are so readily accessible to you as a student, it can, you know, it sort of can give you an easy way out and 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 give you a reason to not attend lectures if you're already getting the grades you need, right? Uh, but you know, that that's that's just given the current environment we're in where we don't 
where educators and students themselves don't know too much about how AI works. And we just have this readily accessible technology that just gives us answers and, and you know, provides us an easy way out on assignments. But I think the potential that it can have as a learning tool, you know, f further, uh, you know, go. I feel like that goes way beyond um, AI as just a, a way to cheat assignments. You know, um, I think AI can be, you know, for example, a way a professor could assign students work where they ask AI chatbots various questions in order to preface, you know, what will be co covered in that class. And then those students on their own, you know, can write written responses and summaries of what they've learned. And, and this will allow the detailed questions, you know, written and tested by the professor to then allow students, you know, to ask tang like tangential or like, you know, s related questions um, before class that can stimulate further thinking and allow for stronger discussions in class. I uh, sort of want to piggyback off of that. Um, one of the classes is, uh, well, Mr. Harris's class, shocking. Um, <laughs> we use um, what's known as Otter AI, which is a uh, transcribe. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, he has a microphone. It's like a triangle. It's a prism. It's cool. He sticks it in the middle of the table and it records all of our, um, uh, like, uh, meeting discussions for class. Um, so in the class I'm talking, moral reasoning is the class that I'm talking about. Um, we can have discussions about certain videos that we watch or uh, different articles that we're reading together, um, and it'll transcribe it. It'll have um, names. So at the end of it, you can um, put names at the top. So you can see, um, you know, how much you've spoken, what you've spoken about. You can highlight things. And it's a great tool to, like, even just go back to if you're using it for a project or an assignment. You can just quickly just go back to it, and you can just have that transcribed right there. And you don't you can just quote it straight from that and it's it's a great tool um and i think focusing more on towards that like uh change how students show up to class i think it's a really great tool um for specifically inside of class like one thing that i um i think i think pretty much well everyone i think it's pretty much guaranteed that everyone at some point in their life will take notes in high school um and one of the things that that's really been helping me is when i'm able to take these notes and go after class and you know put these notes into uh, like an AI or like ChatGPT Chat uh, and say, hey, I'm uh, kind of confused on this part. Can you expand on this part a little bit more? And um, I can really get a more in-depth situation about what I've just learned in the classroom. And I think it's a really great tool for accelerating learning um, in a great way, especially when, in cases where um, uh, I'm not super inclined or like not as passionate about something, but I'm still, I'm still, I still want to learn about something. So I can still great, I can still get a lot of depth in the situation ahead of me, uh, and sort of use that to my capabilities. So, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for me. Yeah. Great. I'm yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Emma. If you have a quick thought, and then we're going to move into our last question because time is Thanks. flying. Oh, then it's all all good. All good. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I completely agree, and I've noticed it's really helped, like like how like Sebastian put it, accelerate learning and just like helping our class actually like engage even more in the classroom, like how Dr. Ostring um and touched upon. So I'd say yeah, it's like been great. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for all of those thoughts. So, as always, with just an hour, time flies. Uh, with so many good thoughts being shared from everyone. I do want to ask one more question before we go into final thoughts, and maybe if we can have one or two of our teachers comment on this, uh, because it is really important and we don't want to skip over it. Uh, how can AI be used as a means for differentiation, personalization, and increasing equity and access for all? So we can have one or two teachers uh, have a share a comment or two, and then I'm going to go to all of our panelists for final thoughts. And that question is going to be, what specific applications do you have open when you're doing homework or planning a lesson? So we've shared a number in the chat already. Uh, but as we do our final thoughts, that'll be our wrap up. So um, would anybody like to talk about the, the equity and access question first? Rachel? 
So as a writing teacher, um, and I think many writing teachers can relate to the overwhelming, how quickly grading writing can become overwhelming with all of the different details in that. And so something that I've noticed is helpful is um, I may not have the time to focus on every single aspect of every single student's essay, but if I'm noticing a pattern or something, for example, a student routinely uses run on sentences, I can suggest to the student, okay, on your own, put a paragraph in and say, identify any run on sentences in this piece. And that way the student is starting to evaluate and look at their writing and say, oh, I'm noticing this is where this is happening. This may be something for me to pay attention to. Or if um, I'm continually urging them to have a stronger thesis statement, I'll have them put their introduction paragraph in and say, what is the thesis statement in this paragraph? And if what the chatbot's response is, is very different from what the student intended, that can signal for the student that they need to go back and revise something. And so being able to give that uh, extended feedback that maybe a teacher in a single class doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to do um, has been a great way, particularly for students who struggle in a certain area to kind of get that feed, individualized feedback on their work. Thank you so much. Anyone else, Christina, comment? So uh, we are um, testing out with our freshman class and about a dozen of our math teachers that work with freshmen, um, Conmigo. So Conmigo is part of Khan Academy, it's their AI tutor. And so when they're interacting with this AI, it's not giving them the answers, it uses it um, as a tutor and kind of walks them through an answer and has them thinking about it as they're going through it. And it has more content areas than math, although that's the one that we're focusing on. So we're starting to see, and we've just started this with the students, but we're also starting to see them use this outside of school hours. So now you've got a tutor that you can have right next to you at home. And that brings um, that knowledge base to you. If you have a student that doesn't maybe communicate real well or feel comfortable doing that with people, now you've got now they've got somebody that they can talk to, and I'm using that loosely. Um, so kind of that giving them the access to a tool like that um, will be interesting to see. Early days for us here, so I can't give you any you know big ahas yet. Um, but similar to what Rachel said, um, the teachers can see what the um, students are chatting about with the chat bot, with the tutor bot, um, so they can also see those patterns and see if there's um, something that maybe they didn't cover in, in class really well. So that's a little bit of that access. Thank you so much, Christina. And I know we could do uh, probably uh, two hours on just that question, so I hate to move us through it quickly, but we're going to do a lightning round wrap up here in the interest of, uh, of time. And I'm going to ask the teachers to go first. So again, the question is, what AI applications do you have open when you're lesson planning or getting ready for class and then for the students when you're doing your homework or doing assignments? So um, if we could start uh, maybe with Morgan, then Rachel, then Christina, then Nate, and then we'll go to the students. All right. Already plugged, I think, most of them. So uh, Otter, uh, if I want to review what's happened in prior classes, uh, um, ChatGPT for a you know, wide variety of things. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, oh yeah, well yeah, Sherpa, Sherpa. Sherpa. Uh, they mentioned also before. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Uh, for us, we're very lucky that we have Savvy built into our platform. So I tend to use that because it's just an ex one extra click on the platform. Um, I do use some ChatGPT to uh, kind of self check some of my instructions, some of my questions, have I phrased them well? Um, we also on our campus use a lot of the Otter AI to uh, summarize meetings. Um, I've used that to summarize discussions and kind of take a look at who hasn't been participating much and what can I follow up on with them? Um, so those are probably the three main ones that uh, I've used. Thank you, Christina. 
so uh, I go back and forth between BARD and ChatGPT. Um, BARD has a, a little Google icon down at the bottom. It's not as strong as ChatGPT yet, but all of these things are shifting. So um, keep an eye on stuff. But they've got a little icon that you could click and uh, BARD goes out and checks its answer against the internet. We'll highlight things in green if it can find it and highlight in red if it's like, eh, I can't really find this, you might wanna double check. Uh, and then in terms of um, programs or, or other tools, uh, Diffit is fantastic. It exports um, everything from Cornell notes to um, slide decks, all sorts of stuff. Magic School AI, um, I'll put these links in um, the chat. I've got a um, Chrome extension that uh, summarizes YouTube videos for me, throws stuff right into chat GPT so that I can um, work with it, which is nice. And there's a little simple one called Goblin Tools. And one of the things in Goblin Tools is they'll break things down step by step. And so if you've got some maybe um, uh, executive dysfunction or something like that in your kiddos, uh, that can help with them kind of uh, working through something. A lot of what I would mention has already been said. I'll just say two things. One, the premium version of ChatGPT is significantly better than the regular version, which brings up all kinds of equity conversations that we need to have. Then secondly, I don't think anyone's mentioned Bing, but bing.com slash chat, uh, you can use very easily and it has access to GPT-4, which is one of the best models. And now Dolly 3 as well, which is one of the best image creators. So for free and ease of use, uh, you can't beat that. And also that can search the internet too. So you can find stuff on the internet and and chat with an AI chatbot about it as well. And for students, I'll turn it over to Daniel first. Um, Thank you, Nate. Uh, so in terms of, you know, what applications I've used to do homework or, you know, or plan a lesson, um, I've, I've used AI, for example, to further explain math problems. I've had trouble learning or understanding, you know, what principles applied. Um, you know, I actually had this conversation with Nate, um, you know, when, when a teacher or a teaching assistant is not readily accessible, for example, uh, in my situation at college, you know, Chad GPT has been a great resource um, in, you know, kickstarting thinking, even though it can be somewhat inaccurate. So I believe that students have to be careful, you know, in, in you know, 100% trusting uh, AI's responses. Uh, you know, um, like someone had mentioned before, I, I feel like it's a great thing that Bing, you know, highlights where they're sort of getting their data from, or like, you know, where they're getting their responses from, and whether you should double check on something, you know. So I, I think it has a, a, a really, it has a, I think that AI bots or chat bots have a great ability to supplement learning when done responsibly. Thanks, Daniel. Let's go to Emma, then Sebastian, and then I'll turn it over to George to wrap us up. Yeah, so I also use um, Savvy and ChatGPT, compare the two answers and see like which one I prefer, um, like especially if it's like a math problem, which one explains it more clearly. Um, yeah, typically using it for like math problems, physics problems, and then also like to review my writing and like rate my writing scene like how is, is it concise does it flow well and also sometimes to like write emails yeah i definitely want to highlight those those things as well everything that the students have said uh one thing i also wanted to add specifically for if you're teaching computer science or like learning computer science github copilot is a great tool to um uh learn a lot about what your process needs to do when the tasks that need to be done uh, as someone who loves computer science I greatly, it, it's free for educators, it's free for all schools, uh, I just need to sign up using, um, there's like a GitHub, there's like a GitHub educators link, uh, and GitHub Copilot is absolutely free for teachers and students, so I really recommend it, especially if you're doing something within computer science, um, so yeah, that, that was my one add-on, so uh, it's great, it's, it's a great tool for computer science. Wow, what an incredible hour. I can't imagine packing more useful information into 60 minutes. You guys rock. This was incredible. Thank you to Kelly and Nate for organizing this. Uh, and thank you to our panelists uh, for your insights and your experience. Um, you guys just, this has been an incredible hour. On behalf of everyone at NEASC and our panelists, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and have a great rest of your day.